the first one up here is Mark and Judy from Garfield Produce. And they're going to tell you the story of their amazing mission. There are two reasons why I wanted them in our group. The first was that I love people who fail at retirement and go on to do something <laughs> after they retire. So that's because there's this myth that you have to be a kid to be an entrepreneur. And I think that's craziness. The second reason I invited you is that because you have the business background that you have, you actually had really solid numbers and could say, yeah, we're going to hit break even. And you would be at break even or better had COVID not hit. And I've never seen an indoor agriculture facility actually do that before. So yeah, with that, go forth and conquer here. Mark and Judy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Tara, thank you so much. Uh, good, af good afternoon, everyone. Mark and I appreciate this opportunity to share with you about Garfield Produce Company. Uh, we're an indoor vertical hydroponic farm located on the west side of Chicago. I'll give some background about how and why we started this venture, and then Mark will discuss our business model and COVID-related pivots. When Mark and I started this venture in 2014, we were retired. As Tara has said often, we failed retirement. I was a corporate attorney, Mark, a finance and operations exec for almost 30 years at the Tribune Company. Our desire was to give back in a tangible, hands-on way. We didn't realize that we would be full-time entrepreneurs with a startup. So uh, very different than, uh, than our initial thoughts. Although we're suburban dwellers, we had volunteered often in the city, in particular at a nonprofit operating homeless shelters and food pantry in uh, East Garfield Park. Uh, through these volunteering experiences and, and work experience, we had learned about the devastating impact of racial inequality and the resulting wealth destruction in primarily African-American neighborhoods. East Garfield Park is located about 30 blocks directly west of the central downtown loop area of Chicago. It once was a vibrant economic and social community. Now it is one of the lowest income, highest crime rate areas of the city. Approximately 95% of the residents are African-American. With the departures of businesses and the decline in population since the 60s, the result has been high joblessness and high incarceration rates. Local job opportunities are scarce, particularly for individuals with criminal records. And about two thirds of the males have been incarcerated in our community. Public programs have been largely ineffective to address the needs of the residents. How can we help? And we wanted to help. Our thought was one way to address those needs was through sustainable local business investment with a long-term commitment to the community and our employees. Our particular response was to create a business, Garfield Produce Company. And we are located in East Garfield Park, actually one block from the men's homeless shelter that we volunteered in. We're in a renovated 6,000 square foot, 100 year old warehouse. We are a social enterprise. So we combine a financially sustainable for-profit business model using up-to-date agricultural technology with a mission to provide sustainable employment opportunities for persons with significant employment barriers. And we focus on hiring individuals with, um, who are returning citizens with criminal records. Our goal in the next five years is to create three or more growing sites in other low-income Chicago neighborhoods, each employing approximately 10 to 17 people. You'll see our indoor grow room. In 2018, with impact debt financing, we were able to relaunch with a newly built climate-controlled grow room and equipment and you can see on the slide our five to six level high modules. We use an NFT rail system. Our systems uh, re use recirculated uh, nutrient water, no soil. We use coconut coir as our substrate and uh, LED lighting. Pivotal to this uh, relaunch was that we created a food safe environment. So we were able to obtain our USDA gap gip certification and meet the food safety requirements to sell to local and regional food distributors. Prior to that, we had our customers have been restaurants, caterers, boutique grocery stores, and uh, sales at farmers markets. Going into the distributors uh, significantly increased our sales volume and we were able to maintain reasonable margins. We show what we, we focused uh, after the relaunch on growing microgreens. And uh, microgreens are beautiful, flavorful, highly nutritious, 
early stage plants. They take about one to three weeks to grow. Chefs love them in salads, sandwiches, as a garnish, as I said, very nutritious. And then our, uh, a bowl of one of our more popular products, which is our rainbow mix, which is a delicious blend of micro broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, mustard, and radish. We also sell some other mixes as well as micro cilantro and arugula. Now, Mark will tell you how the best laid plans can change overnight. <laughs> okay. And now on to our business model, financial results, and our COVID pivots. So our initial funding came from loans from family and friends from, and from locally socially conscious investors. Additionally, Garfield Produce Company was the first recipient of a loan from Benefit Chicago, a social impact fund endowed by the MacArthur Foundation primarily and targeting lending to inner city companies unable to get loans from traditional sources. So right from the start, we established ourselves as a for-profit company. We were tired of the failed government and charity supported programs and operations that litter the inner cities. We wanted Garfield Produce Company to be sustainable. And to that end, we wanted there to be a focus on the bottom line, to be a strong focus on revenue, expenses, and a bottom line that would reinvest back into the business and to repay investors. We also wanted there to be equity to share with our employees. But Judy and I were not as naive as you may think. At the onset, we, we also created a very realistic strategic plan and performed a SWOT analysis. And with minor updates, the strategic plan is still applicable today. The SWOT analysis or strength, weakness, opportunities and threats was really interesting. Weaknesses such as we identified as a large number of unemployed people in the neighborhood and one would think that would be indication of a poor neighborhood and a, and a real weakness to start a business also turned out to be strengths. Mm -hmm. There was a ready workforce available for an employment. Threats also turned out to be opportunities and opportunities turned out to be threats. <laughs> so it was a very interesting process. After initially growing a variety of crops, we ultimately decided to exclusively focus on growing microgreens. As Judy mentioned, microgreens have a fast growing cycle typically in 13 days, and their market price is significantly higher than other commodity types of produce. As Tara has mentioned, and I think she'll go into this a little bit, traditionally it's been extremely difficult to develop profitable indoor growing operations in urban areas without significant scale and substantial automation. So with that in mind, our approach was to walk before we ran. We started small, building a limited growing capacity and selling out that capacity before building any more. We are frugal. Some would say we're cheap. <laughs> we watch our operating expenses and capital expenditures closely. And I think my CPA background helps in being cheap. <laughs> right from startup, we began maintaining detailed production data. In fact, because of that data, we can now predict with great accuracy what the net profit will be for every crop we plant even before it's planted. We also have limited the number of our product SKUs to optimize production capabilities. We are fortunate to have a great self-directed work team. Over 50% of our employees have felony records and were formerly incarcerated. It took a while to develop, but now they understand our business, our customers, our financials, and they work well together, supporting and filling in for one another. And what we've learned is that almost everyone from a background growing up in the inner city seems to have some personal issues or have experienced some sort of trauma that may ultimately impact job performance. It was initially quite disconcerting for me to hear from our employee, Mark, I have to take tomorrow off. I just found out that my cousin was shot and is in intensive care. Job interviews at times can also be heart-wrenching. These were not things that my MBA training prepared me for. Mm -hmm. When we built our indoor grow room, we put a great focus, as Judy said, on food safety. And this did prove critical in selling to food distributors. And as Judy mentioned, that was a good move because mm -hmm. the significant increase in sales volume far exceeded a little lower unit price. We launched our business in 2018 with a food safe climate controlled grow room and sales grew steadily from that point. By December, 2019, as Tara said, 
we had finally exceeded financial break even and were operating profitably. And that really was an incredible breakthrough for us. Then unfortunately COVID appeared. So things were looking great up through February and January and February of 2020. Then COVID appeared. The stay at home orders and the restaurant shutdowns hit us hard. On March 16th, our weekly sales dropped by 95% and remained at that level with only slight improvements over the next weeks. However, fortunately in late April, we were selected to participate in the US Department of Agriculture's Farmers to Families Food Box Program. From mid-May through mid-September, we produced at capacity, selling our microgreens to the USDA, but physically delivering them to local food pantries. Unfortunately, our participation in this program ended in mid-September. And since then, we've had to rely on slowly increasing food distributor sales. And unfortunately, over the last month, the recent indoor dining shutdowns and restrictions have significantly diminished even those sales. During the period from May through September, we did receive a number of government grants and loans. These and the cash generated by our USDA sales have enabled us to develop substantial cash reserves, which currently is allowing us to explore our business pivots. Our pivots, similar to many that we'll hear about today and have heard about, are to one, broaden our product line, and this will include new varieties, develop online sales capabilities, partner with weekly food box programs and businesses, explore collaboration with other hydroponic farms and expand sales to grocery stores. We've all heard the expression, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> Our financial roller coaster ride this year has certainly been memorable. The ongoing support of Edible Alpha and this cadre of businesses has been invaluable. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys so much for what you do. And we've talked about this. Importantly, you have maintained the employment of your employees throughout this whole thing, right? And right. that, because that's your mission. And hopefully things will come around and restaurants will open and we'll get back open in Chicago. But yeah, you, you're, you're pivoting away and you're going to make it through this. I know you are. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for all you do.